other folks. So let me just make a few observations about our two most recent chapters, the one that looks at mysticism and one that looks at faith. Now, to the good, I want to observe that our author has really stepped up here with sources in these chapters as opposed to the first chapter. Uh, that's very important. Also, Paul Varth note that still the majority of the sources just come from the one tradition. And as a result, I have to raise the question is this perhaps uh, is it text bordering upon more theology than forensic religion at this point? So that said, let me share a few observations about these two chapters. So it's worth observing that the great sage Confucius called upon the government to institute what he called the right of judgment of the Mayans. Uh, one example of this is using proper terms to, terms to mean what one wishes to convey. This stands in a very strong opposition to the way that some of the people use words in popular discourse in a very lax and very loose manner. And that's kind of a concern from an academic point of view. Speak and write inexactly. You can expel the very topics that we are trying to address. As in the spirit of Confucian rectification names, let me start off with making a few observations about uh, some key terminology. So our author starts with drawing a distinction between, um, well, he draws an analogy between with the event in a event in Robinson, the novel Robinson Crusoe. And I think that's a good example of the distinction between belief as opposed to knowledge. Um, belief implies some degree of uncertainty. So when Crusoe saw a footprint in the sand which did not fit his own, he reasonably believed he was in the world. While when he encounters Friday, I would argue that it would be more correct to say that he now has knowledge than he's not alone. A footprint could conceivably be misconstrued. An orangutan footprint looks very much like a human footprint, for example. Uh, but the sight of a living human being, that's knowledge. The similar thing is all too common for the, term, for the terms of religious experience and mystical experience to mean a similar. I believe that our author draws a distinction on page 59. Now, another common definition of mystical experience is a direct, unmediated experience of the divine. Well, spiritual experience, however, is typically mediated by some sort of religious practice. Say someone feeling a divine presence when, when they're reading the Bible or the Quran, for example, or I've known Roman Catholics who claim that they felt the, the presence of God while they were praying the rosary, for example. Now, <clears throat> the great scholar of world religions, one of my favorites, Houston Smith, he discerned three common traits in all accounts of mystical experience in all the major world traditions. The first one was what he called ineffability an experience that is beyond words, which is why mystics usually resort to metaphor, story, or poetry when they're sending out to convey what their experience is like. Unity, an experience of all things being interconnected. And finally, goodness, that there's something essentially good about that underlying interconnected essential reality. Another important distinction. Um, our author uses the word delusion, but sometimes I think what he really means is hallucination. There's an important distinction there. A hallucination is an experience of seeing or hearing something that isn't there. A delusion, though, is a matter of how we interpret our sense experience. And I'll be able to read it, they're very distinct. If, for example, I start talking to one of my house cats, perceiving him to be in my home office, and he's not there, well, my wife would be very right be alarmed because that would be a hallucination. However, 
if I heard a cat howling and thought it was the neighbor's outdoor cat, when it's one of my own hoggies, that would be a delusion. A cat's cry is audible but misinterpreted. He does that, by the way, when he really, really wants attention and he wants us to come out of the office and pet him. So let me make some general observations and clarifications and elaborations. Now, the author's assumption on page 62 that God is a perfectly good being, although standard in the Abrahamic traditions, is not the default understanding of all theisms. Malthus would contend that God is not good, and polytheist traditions typically have gods that, while immensely powerful, are not perfect. Um, on page 62, our author states that the plurality of religions cannot all be true, and that as a result, religious experience in different religions, that, that not all of these religious experiences can be vertical perceptions of the divine presence. Let me share a couple of observations of this. And it's an um, observation he makes in both chapters. Now, this attitude that he's expressing is an example of what the scholar John Hick called exclusivism, the notion that only one religion or, or another, a group of religions had the one true religious understanding. As contrasted to this, most religious traditions are either pluralist, the notion that all religions are true, or inclusivist, all religions have some truth, but one or another has a greater amount of truth. Now there's a uh, related concept, omnism. Omnism is the theism that holds that all religions are true. The difference in practices, doctrines, beliefs, mythology is usually accounted for by how different cultural systems configure and interpret the experience of the divine. In another way, if you are Hindu and you have an experience, the divine will understand it in the context of the Hindu gods. If you're Christian, you understand it in terms of Jesus, etc. Now, um, extro extroverted experience is also known as a visionary experience, and it is a subset of, oh, can I go far? Yeah. And it is a um, subset of mysticism in general. Put another way, not all mystics are visionary, but all visionaries are mystics. Walt Whitman's poem, Leaves of Grass, exemplifies this kind of experience. Introverted experience, the example of the Buddha meditating under the bow tree is the classic example. He is an example, that's an example of what's also known as autotheism, where one looks within to find the deity. This is typical of many forms of yoga and also Buddhism. In chapter six, author uses the words faith and belief as synonyms. Although related, I think there's some key distinctions that bear our emphasis. One common definition of faith is the affirmation of something as true in the lack absence of evidence. Knowledge, on the other hand, admits of little if any ambiguity. I know that my cat is sleeping next to my computer as I type this because, or record this, because I can see her, hear her, she purrs very, very loudly, and if we reach out to her, I can touch her. The leap falls in the gray area between knowledge and our faith. It has some basis in evidence, so it isn't faith, but it leaves room for inference or interpretation, so it isn't direct knowledge. And let's return to the example of Robinson Crusoe. We back up to that image. Now, if Crusoe, as soon as he finds himself on the island, tries to get his spirits up by continually affirming to himself, there must be people around here somewhere. I know that's, that must be. Well, and to me, as evidence, that's a faith statement. Once Crusoe sees a set of footprints in the beach that do not match his own, he has belief. He has some reasonable basis for drawing this inference. Once he actually encounters the Friday, he has experience and thus uh, the knowledge that he is not alone. Thus, technically, a mystic cannot have faith precisely because they have direct 
unmediated experience of the divine. On page 81 and further, our author, although talking about William James, outlines an argument typically referred to as Pascal's wager. Um, Pascal reasoned there were four possibilities. God exists and someone believes in him. God exists and someone denies his existence. God doesn't exist and someone believes in him. God doesn't exist and the given person doesn't believe in him. Well, Pascal considered all the implications of these four different options, and he argued that the only reasonable thing to do is to make the assumption that there is a God, even in the absence of evidence, because if there's no God and you believe in it, well, nothing's going to happen. And if you uh, take the viewpoint that there is no God and there is no God, well, again, nothing's going to happen. But if you believe in God and there is a God, you have experienced eternal joy. And if you take the position of atheism and there is a God, then, uh, sorry, Charlie, you're subject to eternal suffering. Now, let me drop out the share function and make just a last few observations. On page 83, our author um, observes that it is only if God exists that there is some vital good, eternal life, that is at stake in the decision. Now, that's consistent with what some scholars and scientists have called terror management theory. This is the notion of the reason why religion arose in the first place is because human beings are the one creature, so far as we know, who are aware of their own mortality and that religion was a way of fending off the existential terror that results from that awareness. To borrow from Thomas Aquinas, Summa Theologica said contra, the counter argument, not all religions are from an afterlife. In most forms of Buddhism, the ultimate reality is on Atma that we do not have a stable internal essence. That whenever, when we, do, we die, everything that is part of who we are uh, dissolves back into the universe. That's, I would also add, very consistent with the philosophy of Epicurus. In Hinduism, the ultimate goal is moksha, or liberation from the cycle of life that we rebirth. It is believed that when this is attained, you will attain nirvana. You lose your individuality by becoming one of the universal soul. Um, the analogy is that it's often used is it's like our individual soul is a drop of water in a uh, dropper, and it's dropped into the ocean. Well, what becomes of that individual drop? Does it disappear or does it effectively? become the ocean. I don't have this in my print version, but I'll share one little joke. There's an old joke about Hinduism, what did the, or I'm sorry, Buddhism, what did the Buddhist sage say to the hot dog vendor? Make me one. So, there's some observations and reflections about these two chapters. I hope this has been of help. Please let me know. And I finally have, I finally have the textbook in print. So maybe, so I'm hoping that I can make these kind of announcements on a weekly basis. We'll see if I'm open. Ciao for now.